Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 poorly acted movie deaths. I love my eyes! My eyes! Ah! For this list, we'll be ranking the cringiest, most unintentionally funny, or poorly acted death scenes of all time. Spoilers and unintentional laughter ahead. Have you seen any of these films? Let us know in the comments. Number 20. Don't Push Me, The Untouchables. The backstory behind this scene from 1987's The Untouchables is actually full of tension and drama. It just doesn't quite stick the landing. Don't just stand there. Harass me. Don't push me. Well, that's not entirely true, because Billy Drago's Frank and Nitty does indeed land painfully on a car after being pushed from a building by Kevin Costner's Elliot Ness. It's more the background behind Nitty as he falls that hurts the scene, combined with Drago's slightly exaggerated reaction shots. This isn't the most egregious movie death on this list, and Costner does salvage the scene with his final words to Nitty, but it's definitely not perfect. Number 19, Prince's End, Under the Cherry Moon. Prince's Purple Rain may be better known, but 1986's Under the Cherry Moon was actually directed by the Purple One. Mary. The film is also notable for Prince's death scene near the end of the film, which perhaps proves that the man was probably better suited to music. Don't get us wrong, Under the Cherry Moon is still the sort of stylish vanity project that could have only been birthed from Prince at the height of his commercial influence. Yeah, fun, didn't it? Still, the man's peaceful passing after being shot by an assassin's bullet wasn't going to win any Academy Awards. Under the Cherry Moon would instead go on to win five golden raspberries. Number 18, Rick's Death. Nightcrawler. 2014's Nightcrawler featured a stellar performance by Jake Gyllenhaal as a morally bankrupt freelance photojournalist by the name of Lou Bloom. The film also starred Riz Ahmed as Rick, an unhoused man who was employed by Lou as an assistant about midway through the film. Rick, seeing Lou's unscrupulous methods, attempts to extort his employer, but it all goes pear-shaped when Lou turns the tables. You're crazy. You're crazy. Rick's death scene after being shot at a crime scene isn't great. Gyllenhaal acts circles around him, and the overly dramatic closing of the eyes by Ahmed feels unrealistic compared to the violence of what just occurred. This could have been so much better, especially since we know Ahmed is a great actor. Number 17, Not Like This. The Matrix. A lot of collective details go into an actor's performance, from line delivery nuances to facial expressions. By the way, if you have anything terribly important to say to Switch, I suggest you say it now. Oh no, please don't. Belinda McClory's death scene in the first Matrix film comes as a shock to the audience, as Nebuchadnezzar crew member Switch is among those eliminated by Cypher when his betrayal is revealed. McClory's final words of not like this don't exactly ring with fear or passion, but are rather understated in their delivery. Not like this. Not like this. To compound matters, the accompanying facial reaction feels slightly comedic, lightening the otherwise tense mood in the scene. Maybe another take or two was in order? Number 16. Thank you. Mission Impossible 3. The opening sequence to Mission Impossible 3 references other scenes from the franchise where the best laid plans of protagonist Ethan Hunt and crew go awry. God, what is that? You can't hear that? Hunt's team does successfully rescue IMF agent Lindsay Ferris after the latter was captured in Berlin. Unfortunately, the deadly implant placed within Ferris's head by her captors detonates before Hunt can save her life. Carrie Russell's performance as Ferris is brief but memorable, perhaps for some of the wrong reasons. Her death is anticlimactic, while Russell's facial expression after telling Ethan, thank you, is jarring. Ethan, thank you. We're not exactly sure if it looks creepy, disturbing, or downright bad, but hey, we never forgot it. Number 15, Howard Saint, The Punisher. Is there any comic book revenge story as established and ingrained within the medium's culture as that of Frank Castle? The loss of Castle's family directly leads to the man's transformation into The Punisher. Although, this 2004 film adaptation pins the blame on John Travolta's crime boss, Howard Saint. The 
The revenge story is the same, however, and by the end, we're dying for Travolta to get his comeuppance. It's all a bit anticlimactic, unfortunately, as Castle shoots Saint without much fanfare. It's underwhelming, to say the least, and Travolta's performance would have perhaps benefited from a bit more scenery chewing. Number 14, Pointless Sacrifice, Dante's Peak. The heyday of the 70s disaster film felt long gone by the time this 90s flick hit theaters. Dante's Peak is peak camp silliness, while at the same time taking itself, for the most part, with stone-faced seriousness. See this pointless sacrifice for proof, as Elizabeth Hoffman's Ruth makes the boneheaded decision to jump from a boat into water that has become acidic with volcanic materials. The boat was almost there, you guys! <laughs> The group effort was working to push their craft safely to shore. The scene just feels there to hit a story beat, while the acidic aftermath of Ruth's legs also feels out of place. Maybe the writers just couldn't figure out any other way to get the character out of the movie. <sighs> Number 13, Death by Frisbee. Hard ticket to Hawaii. Hey, hey, partners, do you read me? Roger. The weather's great here on the beach. Why don't you come on down? Dante's Peak may have taken itself seriously, but no one will likely be making the same accusations against the cinema of Andy Sedaris. The former director of ABC's Wide World of Sports made the transition into movie making during the 1970s and 80s, specializing in action-filled exploitation flicks with plenty of skin. Hard Ticket to Hawaii was released smack dab in the middle of Sedaris' most prolific period in the late 80s, and featured a scene where a character is killed by… a frisbee? Well, it's a frisbee lined with razor blades, to be precise, and its end results are as bloody and overblown as you'd expect from a director of Sedaris' pedigree. This is for the Molokai cops. Number 12, Plant-Based, Troll 2. Narrowing down a poorly acted movie death from Troll 2 feels like shooting fish in a barrel. It's just too easy. The oh my god scene has been memed to death at this point, but the whole sequence should still be analyzed for what's perhaps one of the Italian exploitation film industry's wildest fever dreams. Essentially, we have a double whammy. There's the random girl that Arnold finds running from goblins in the woods. Almost as soon as she appears, she's turned into veggies by a witch and eaten by said goblins. Then it's Arnold's turn, as he too falls victim to the witch's nefarious magic. This won't hurt you. You just feel a little tickled, little flower. <laughs> Oh my god indeed. Number 11, Cat Scratch Fever, Snake in the Eagle's Shadow. This early gem from Jackie Chan featured one incredibly memorable death scene from one of the man's opponents, an American martial artist, Roy Horan. Horan played a Russian assassin in the film, but his attempts to take down Chan are thwarted when the latter busts out his new cat claw technique in their fight. Chan's animal instincts take hold, and his claws strike Horan directly in his nether regions, putting the American out for the count. We can't help but laugh at Horan's exaggerated screaming and quick head snap down to dreamland after getting clawed by Chan. This is the sort of dubbed kung fu madness that was a staple on cable television back in the 1980s. Number 10, Bed Death. Deathbed, The Bed That Eats. They call them cult classics for a reason, right? Deathbed, The Bed That Eats was a forgotten obscurity for many years until stories of its weirdness earned it a fan base and a physical media release. It certainly could have nothing to do with Reverend Fusberg. the seat of our father. Uh, uh, hmm? Hmm? This story of a supernatural, demon-possessed bed is full of surreal scenes, but the sequence where a priest is devoured by the bed is memorable, thanks to the performance of Jock Brandis. The future inventor and author worked on Deathbed when he was a young man, and Brandis' on-screen inexperience is obvious from the actor's bemused expression. <laughs> This 
It's all in good fun, of course, but yeah, Brandis certainly wasn't winning any Academy Awards for this one. Number 9. Slow Motion, Karatachi Kuz. You must get him right in the heart. After shooting him once, you must shoot again. Often memed, slightly edited, but never duplicated, this slow motion death scene from the 1970s Turkish exploitation film industry has to be seen to be believed. That's because this sequence from Karatachi Kuz, also known as Karate Girl, features a henchman with a very memorable reaction to being shot. Oh, the scene is shot in slow motion, sure, but both the unedited original and its viral meme iteration seem to go on forever, honestly to the point of parody. Karate Girl is actually fairly grim and violent throughout the lion's share of its running time, but you probably wouldn't know that based solely on the context of this infamous scene. <laughs> Number 8. Que sera, sera, Enter the Ninja Let's get one thing out of the way first. Christopher George was a fine actor, with many memorable scene-stealing performances under his belt. <laughs> Don't let her go! George's death scene from 1981's Enter the Ninja also steals the show, but for all the wrong reasons. The actor almost seems okay with getting a shuriken in the chest from our ninja antagonist, Franco Nero. Oh, George screams alright, but then he just sort of shrugs, smirks, and falls down dead. It's a performance that we almost can't believe actually exists. But yep, there it is, for all of us to meme until the end of time. Number seven, prepare yourselves. The Dark Knight Rises. There's no way this bomb will be stopped. Marion Cotillard is another actor with a wealth of amazing performances to her resume. But here in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight Rises, she just falls flat. Her death scene occurs near the climax of the film, when the stakes are high and all kinds of puzzle pieces are beginning to fall into place as the tension ramps up. My father's work is done. Kotiar's little head move after her character of Talia al Ghul dies in a car crash feels unintentionally funny, the sort of actor tick that may have worked better in Kotiar's head, but it felt weird to see on screen. Number 6. It had to be this way. The Wolfman. You've seen it a million times, where a film's protagonist dies in the arms of their beloved, expiring after one last monologue, or memorably defining statement. The Wolfman from 2010 uses this trope, but not really very well as Benicio Del Toro's Lawrence Talbot is cradled by Emily Blunt's Gwen Conliffe. Gwen. I'm sorry. You got to be this way. Talbot's message rings true, that the cycle of the wolf is eternal, and that there will always be another to take on the curse of the full moon. However, it's just not expressed with enough pathos or poeticism to lend this otherwise critical moment in the film the respect it deserves. Number 5. Dad, The Godfather Part 3 The casting of the young and inexperienced Sofia Coppola in her father's second sequel to The Godfather was one that caused some consternation at the time of the film's release. This was thanks largely to the quality of her performance, exemplified in scenes like this one, where her character of Mary Corleone is shot near the end of the film. Opinions of the scene, like those of the film, tend to be negative, with many pointing out that aforementioned inexperience is one of the reasons why Coppola's death scene feels stilted. To be fair though, the reactions of Coppola's co-stars aren't much better, with histrionics that border on self-parody. No! Mary! Mary! No! Oh God, no! Oh God, no! No! Oh God, no, please! Number 4. Oh my, Star Trek Generations. How closely should an actor's death scene reflect the severity of his wounds? Most film fans would probably answer pretty closely, but apparently no one sent that memo to William Shatner on the set of Star Trek Generations. Did we do it? We make a difference. Oh yes. 
Shatner's iconic Captain James T. Kirk has suffered fatal wounds and is buried in rubble. He has a brief conversation with Captain Jean-Luc Picard that feels as if Kirk is just laying down, taking a rest. The scene does turn a bit poignant as Kirk reflects upon captaining the Enterprise, but then Shatner decides to leave us with an oh my that effectively severs that emotional tie with one bad decision. Oh my. Number 3. The Bees. The Wicker Man. Does it matter that the Bees sequence from the 2006 remake of The Wicker Man was only presented in the extended home video cut? Not really, especially when considering how much life the scene has taken on via the internet, so many years after its initial release. What is it? What is it? What, what is it? What is it? What is it? Oh no, no, not the Bees! Not the Bees! To be fair, the Nicolas Cage performance is full of wait what choices, from way too intense interrogations about doll burnings, to punching characters while wearing a bear outfit. Cage's astronomical reactions to bee torture take the cake, however, since the character is supposed to be deathly allergic. Oh, my eyes! My eyes! Ah! Ah! <laughs> The actor is then brought to the titular Wicker Man for his final sacrifice, but we just can't forget those bees, man. <laughs> Number 2. The Big Ride. Face Off. Missed it by… that much. Face Off rules. Let's get that out of the way first. And the ending rules, apart from one little detail. Both Nicolas Cage and John Travolta deliver the goods with their performances, but the latter probably should have just left his climactic death scene without this final send-off. Travolta as Caster Troy as Sean Archer has just been impaled and attempted to slice off his own face. Additionally, Nicolas Cage as Sean Archer as Caster Troy has just screamed with all the intensity of a freight train. <laughs> And that would have been enough, but unfortunately, Travolta needs to mumble sing being ready for the big ride, baby. Sometimes, silence is golden. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Is he dead? The Room. Is The Room bad, or so bad it's good? Well, bad. The answer is bad, actually. But that doesn't mean that we can't enjoy this ridiculous death scene at the film's climax. <laughs> My god, Mark, is he dead? We're not sure what's worse, Tommy Wiseau's Tennessee Williams delusions, or the reactions of his co-stars after Wiseau's Johnny self-destructs. What we're seeing is clearly fatal and self-inflicted, yet The Room still needs to beg the question, is he dead? Oh my god. Well, yes, Johnny is definitely dead, and we're sure no one will ever talk about The Room ever again. Just kidding, The Room will never go away, whether you want it to or not. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.